Hi, and welcome to the X22 Report Spotlight. Today we have a returning guest, Rob Kirby. He's from KirbyAnalytics.com, and I am very happy to have him back on the X22 Report Spotlight. Rob, welcome back to the Spotlight. Pleasure to be with you, Dave, and Happy New Year. Oh, Happy New Year to you too, and here we are in 2017, and the beginning of the year, we see the Dow approaching 20,000 points, and we see gold is still hovering around 1,100 and change, and my first question to you is what is your opinion and what, what do you have on why gold has dropped to 1100 and there are those individuals out there saying that it's going to go down even further what is your take on where gold is where gold is heading in this new year well i would uh, uh, suggest to anybody who wants to listen that the price of or the paper price of gold and silver both were attacked um uh, with with a lot of zeal on the back of the uh, election of Donald J. Trump on November eighth, and if if you were paying if you were paying attention on election night, you you would note that the initial reaction to Trump being uh, uh, awarded the win uh, was for the Dow Jones futures to initially sewer to the tune of eight hundred points. And gold was up roughly $70 uh, in the minutes after uh, Trump, it became apparent that Trump had won. And lo and behold, the central planners uh, that, that are the plunge protection team and the edifice surrounding it in America showed up for work. And the uh, $70 up in gold was turned around and uh, you know, made into a $70 down and the 800 uh, within 24 hours, the 800 point down for the Dow was uh, translated into a three or 400 point up. Uh, the, these were, these were clearly, clearly and utterly uh, the work of central planners because we know for a fact that the volume of paper gold contracts that were sold in the three days uh, following the election amounted to, uh, let's just say three times annual global mine production in gold sold in paper form in three short days, uh, beginning, beginning late in the day on the 8th through to the Friday. Uh, three years worth of global mine supply was sold in paper form in, in, in the gold market alone. You see, this this is the hallmark. This is the signature of 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 interference and, and of price suppression. And what what the elitists who control our system currently are paranoid of is that we we get a manic we get a manic takeoff in the price of metals because the, uh, the physical, the physical metals market does represent a challenge to this as, uh, you know, the supremacy of the dollar as the world's primary reserve currency. So Dave, what we, what we've seen over the last little while is a very, very concerted attack on the paper price of precious metals because central planners do not want uh, uh, metals, specifically silver and gold, assume their rightful mantle as uh, as money, which they are, by the way. Whether 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 they're suppressed or not, they are. They will always be the go-to, and and the uh, uh, you know the, the 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 true expression of desire. Uh, for for the world's population as money, and isn't it interesting? Um, in 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 light of this severe suppressive action being taken by monetary the monetary elites, and it's and it's been more than just the, the straight paper markets that have been affected because they've also been trying to work over very hard the uh, the organic demand for physical precious metal uh, with actions that, that have been taken in India. And, and let me just frame, frame up the Indian situation a little bit here because the head of the Reserve Bank of India uh, is, a, is a chap with a last name Rajan 
And Mr. Rajan is the vice chairman of, of an institution called the Bank for Inter International Settlements, which is headquartered in Basel, Switzerland. And the, the uh, Bank for International Settlements is often referred to as the central bank for central banks in that global central bank policies are typically coordinated through the Bank for International Settlements and, and, and implemented from that point. So the, the attacks that we've been seeing on metals have been global in nature and not just limited to the, to the uh, paper markets in uh, both New York and in London, uh, New York on the COMEX exchange and London on the London Bullion Market, uh, uh, L London Bullion Market Association, LBMA. What, what the experiment that they've been working with or that they tried to implement in, in India was they effectively outlawed 500 and 1,000 rupee notes, which uh, the old notes constituted something close to 90% of all currency in circulation in India. And people should realize that the, uh, or, or would do well to realize that the gold market in India is a cash market and it's a physical market where people exchange banknotes for physical coins and or bars and or jewelry. And by, by outlawing 90% of the float of fiat currency in the country, um, I mean, what they did is they created chaos, but they 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 were they were clearly trying to dampen uh, demand and, and the trade for physical metal by outlawing the old currency. And when they outlawed the old currency, they tried to give a backstory that the old currency was readily exchangeable for new currency. And the, but but the problem was they didn't have enough of the new currency printed and on hand to allow people to do one for one exchanges, and the, and they they rationed the new currency. So so what they in effect did was say to people, you can bring your old currency to the bank and deposit it, but then we will only allow you to extract it something like to the equivalent of sixty dollars a day. And so this way they put. They put a they they put a basically they made or created artificial scar scarcity of currency in 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 the country, and uh, uh, what they were what they were trying to do was dampen demand or dampen the amount of takeoff of physical uh, gold bullion, and uh, interestingly it, it would seem by most accounts that I've read that that was a complete and utter failure and if anything gold consumption is up in in India and and as a corollary to that story while these concerted attacks by officialdom have been occurring on paper metal and physical metal paper metal in 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 the case of the two exchanges I mentioned formerly and on the physical side in in India we have seen a dramatic and I mean a very dramatic rise in the price of Bitcoin which is a cryptocurrency but which some people and in, and, and in particular the Chinese see as a viable alternative to fiat money so isn't isn't it interesting that you can you can suppress so many things, but suppressing and, and, and I find this very, very interesting and very ironic at the same time, because physical metal is being suppressed. But yet, uh, because physical metal, uh, 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 let's just say it this way, Dave, on an exchange, uh, the people buying and selling on an exchange in, in, in paper gold and silver they don't they can't tell the difference between a physical ounce and a paper ounce because they all get sort of mixed into the same call it a slurry but you go to the cryptocurrencies like bitcoin and you, you cannot sell a bitcoin unless you own a bitcoin 
There is no futures market for Bitcoin. There is no optionality in Bitcoin. If you want to buy a Bitcoin, you need to you need to create an account and then you need to pay with fiat money. And to sell a Bitcoin, you must have a Bitcoin. You cannot sell Bitcoin you do not own. And isn't it interesting that when something pops its head up with any kind of a possibility of being an alternative, how its price takes off in a real market where, where, where there isn't interference, where there isn't suppression. And anyway, I found this as a very, very interesting thing because like our, our global capital markets are a very complex place with a lot of moving parts at the same time. But there are pictures that emerge from what is occurring if you have your wits about you and if you're if you're paying attention. So and anyway, I don't I don't say this as an endorsement of Bitcoin. I, I don't say it as an endorsement or a rejection of anything. All I'm saying is, isn't it interesting that when you have a forum where where basically free market conditions prevail, isn't it interesting what happens in a free market? Yeah, alternatives when... alternatives can rise in price dramatically, but in controlled markets, it's not allowed. That that is very interesting. How when the central bankers they're not really touching it getting involved in it because we know the precious metals market from Deutsche Bank, uh, UBS and HSBC, we know that, you know, they were manipulating it most likely goes all the way to the top of uh, where the central banks are manipulating the precious metals market. When they're not touching it, when they're not controlling it, it's amazing how it does take off. But Dave, um, yeah, but Dave, and listen, I sorry, I have to interject here because there's, there's, there's another point, another big, big point to be made here. Okay. I mean, the, Precious metal price suppression begins and ends with American banks. Why has not one American bank been named in this in this uh, 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 precious metals rigging case? That's that's a question, uh, you know. And and I'd like someone to answer it. Somebody somebody from officialdom, because you see, precious metals are all about the U.S. dollar. And the, 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 the ringleader in, in, in precious metals price suppression is, is the U.S. Treasury itself, and namely the Exchange Stabilization Fund, which is a secretive arm of the U.S. Treasury that's engaged in everything and anything and operates above all laws. And they use as their agents uh, uh, the broker for the Exchange Stabilization Fund is the New York Federal Reserve Trading Desk. And the New York Federal Reserve Trading Desk, acting as broker for the Exchange Stabilization Fund, uh, disseminates their orders to the commercial banks, the big derivatives houses in New York. And anybody, anybody who does not believe that J.P. Morgan is the biggest trader in, 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 in precious metal on the planet, uh, uh, you know, has their head somewhere where, where the sun doesn't shine. And, and, two, and two, or two or three of the other largest players in the world in the same are Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and Citibank. And Bank of America, too, for that matter. And, you know, the notion, the notion that other banks of other nationalities would be engaged in something that the American banks wouldn't be is a, is a dog that just doesn't hunt. Huh. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I, I believe that this goes throughout the American banks and all the way up to the, the central banks. I don't think this is just, you know, the HSBC. It's not just Deutsche Bank. I think it's much more widespread than what they're letting us know and what they found out at this point. Well, the big, the big thing is, you know, the question you have to ask is that I think in Latin they say, qui bono, who benefits? Who right. benefits from a suppressed metals price? Well, the, the biggest the biggest beneficiaries of suppressed metals are the owners of the current world reserve currency which is america and the us dollar so anything that would be this vital to the american dollar and and us national interests you don't think that there would be a, a huge american bank front and center in all of this 
The proposition is ridiculous to begin with, that anyone even would entertain having such a discussion. Now, you mentioned uh, India about how they were cashing the, uh, I mean, um, banning the 500 and 1,000 rupee. We also see Greece right now, they're doing what's called a soft cash ban. And we're seeing a lot of these countries do this where they're trying to, I guess, take away the idea of using cash. And it looks like Greece right now, they're telling their taxpayers that you have to spend a certain amount only using plastic, you know, the debit card or whatever. You cannot use cash. And if you don't do what we say, you're penalized. And we're starting to see this spread throughout different countries. Do you think they're taking these countries and using them as test beds to see how the cashless society will work? Oh, absolutely they are, Dave. And I mean, the, 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 what, what they won't admit, but what they are in fact doing, is they are trying, trying to institute uh, um, currency regimes or currency schemes where, where every transaction can be tracked and, and basically where, where transactions in undesirable things can be, can be uh, either eliminated or curtailed. And if you, you see, when you're doing business in cash bills, your transactions are quite anonymous because you can exchange, you know, a wad of bills for, you know, maybe a gold coin or two or three. And, uh, you know, the government has no way of tracking where the gold is and who owns it. But if they can, if they can get everybody onto a digital platform where every transaction is cataloged and, and, uh, uh, you know, can be basically assigned a number, then they know, they know who has what and at what price they paid for, and uh, and, and this way they can uh, you know they can con control trade. I mean uh, that's that's what they want. But this has always been a wet dream of the new world order or the globalists, uh, where they want to have a one world currency. Ideally, it would be a digital currency and one which would allow them to track and catalog uh, and surveil everything that everyone does, period. And uh, th this, this is a dream of theirs, and to, to, to which end or to what point they're going to be able to achieve this, I would say, uh, I would say the jury is still out on all that. So do you think their plans right now are kind of shaken up because of Trump being now elected as the president of the United States, you think things are not going the way they want? Because we see Trump out there, we see the stock market moving up, and it's just amazing how at the end of Obama's presidency, this, their statistical numbers, you know, unemployment, GDP, I mean, that all looks fantastic. The stock market is approaching 20,000 points. Are they doing this as a last hurrah to say, look, Look what I've done over the last eight years. Look at the economy. It's incredible. And then they're going to hand it off to uh, to Trump and, you know, whatever policies he puts into place and whatever they do, they you know, maybe they'll crash the economy at the time while he takes office. They'll just blame everything on him. Well, my, my gut tells me, and it's not even my gut, my, what my eyes, what my eyes are telling me because of what I'm reading and what I am seeing in front of me. There has been an enormous attempt to delegitimize the victory of Trump and, and and the presidency of Trump before he ever gets sworn into office. You know, we, we have seen this illustrated through the uh, claims that Russia was was responsible for uh, uh, basically altering the vote to get him into office to begin with. Uh, that's a, that's a complete and utter slap in the face uh, to 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 his presidency. The the other things that we've we've been made aware of, like in the last week, is record amounts of legislation uh, for a lame duck president that Obama has been uh, uh, furiously signing legislation over the last few weeks, uh, effectively trying to create roadblocks for Trump and to. 
uh, uh, protect and and uh, perpetuate his 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 legacy. And I mean, this this is uh, the the extent to which this is being done. It's even been reported in in the dinosaur media who hate Trump as unprecedented. So, you know, great great lengths have been taken to delegitimize Trump. Uh, frankly, I think I think Trump is in is in mortal danger still. He has not been uh, he has not been uh, you know sworn in, and uh, he has an inauguration date of the twentieth of January. And uh, I I frankly hope and pray that Trump's alive to assume office on that date, because I think there's there's absolutely a clear and present danger for him, and what he stands for. You see, Trump is anti-globalist. Trump, Trump is not front. Trump is a free trader, and uh, when I say free trader, I mean a real free trader, not a managed trader, not one of these, uh, not one of these uh, people that supports uh, these these transcontinental uh, treaties, which they call trade agreements, uh, where where signatories give up their sovereignty. And uh, Trump is very against that. Trump is a is a nationalist and a, and a populist, and I think the world needs a whole lot more of that right now. But uh, the globalists still run the show on this planet, and uh, they, they do view, uh, no doubt, they view Trump as a as a complete danger. Do you think Trump does have the ability to turn everything around? Or do you think the globalists are going to stop them at every turn? I don't think the globalists will ever will ever give up, but I, but I feel that uh, Trump has the ability to, if not if not derail their plans, let's just say maybe set set them back 50, 75 years. Yeah, he's a complete and utter spanner in the gears of 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 where the world was headed and would have been headed under the. Uh, under the presidency of uh, Hillary Clinton. Now, I, last time we spoke, we spoke about the uh, petrodollar, and we can see out in um, Syria, we see out the Middle East, in the in the Middle East with all these different countries where the U.S. is losing in this area. Russia and the Syrian government they're pushing the paid mercenaries that the United States government were using in Syria. They're 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 not gaining ground anymore. They're actually losing ground, and the whole idea to you know prop up the petrodollar it's it looks like it's coming to an end uh do you see this as coming to an end do you think the petrodollar is at its end stage i think that the petrodollar's uh, days are limited um i think i think the i think the, the the u.s the u.s currency and america has had a huge huge run at the top of the heap and i do believe that there is a natural uh, changing of uh, changing of the guard that's going to unfold uh, if if nothing more than the 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 manner in which the uh, world's reserve currency the dollar has been managed by the you know by the stewards the, the people in charge they've been they've been extremely reckless they've they've printed way too many dollars there are way too many dollar obligations in the world and uh, uh, for for people who for people who are of the opinion that you know there's too many dollars in the world or there there's not an, sorry there's not enough and there are people who believe that there are not enough dollars in the world uh, uh, and uh, I mean they make the argument on the back of um, Basically, when new like uh, the, the dollar is a debt-based currency, and 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 dollars are created through the issuance of debt, and when debt is issued, not enough, not enough new money is created to pay the interest on the <laughs> on on the newly created money to actually allow for the repayment of principal plus interest, and you know that that. In, in in math in math terms that can uh, create create big issues um, uh, at at some point um, when the amount of money in in in, in existence uh, 
it, 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 it's it's interesting because it's a sort of a mathematical formula where where it, when you create money with interest, uh, you you can have a growth rate of of a very 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 smooth, very gently sloping up to the right uh, curve, and then at some point, uh, depending on time and depending on cap rate. Uh, uh, where, where the uh, amount of money in existence inflects and has to grow vertical. And we're on that part of the curve now where the amount of money basically is growing vertically, whether, whether the Fed is acknowledging that they're printing or, or doing QE uh, it, to me is irrelevant because when, when, when looking at money supply, you have to, at least in my view, you have to take into consideration that you can't look at one central bank like the Fed in isolation because the central banks are all connected through cross-currency uh, uh, swap arrangements where, where the Bank of Japan can do the printing and then they can swap their yen uh, uh, for dollars with the Fed. And the European Central Bank has similar agreements with both the Bank of Japan and the Fed where the European Central Bank can create the money. They can then swap swap their euros that they've created out of thin air uh, for dollars. So, so the notion that there is never enough dollars in existence because the Fed isn't directly printing them, to me, is, is a non-starter because other central banks have the ability to create effectively unlimited amounts of U.S. dollars just as the Fed can. And the other thing I would suggest to people uh, you might want to pay attention to the notion that even in the mainstream, we've we've heard in the last year that there have been record foreign sales of U.S. government debt. Well, you see, when you have record foreign sales of U.S. government debt, that is not a vote of confidence in the dollar. So you have to start asking yourself, why has the dollar risen when when countries around the world are, are, are liquidating U.S. dollar obligations and because there's something there that doesn't jive. It's a red flag. And if, if uh, uh, the other thing we have to ask ourselves, if, if the Fed isn't, isn't conducting and they are not officially conducting any quantitative easing or, or, or asset buying programs, who's buying all this debt that all the foreign countries around the world are liquidating. Because America's, I mean, America's biggest financiers, uh, interestingly uh, and historically, China has, and, 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 uh, and Japan have been huge financiers of, of, of American largesse. Um, but I, I find it absolutely monstrously incredibly interesting that the third largest holder of U.S. government securities in 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 a reserve account, um, at uh, I think the number is 260 billion uh, worth of U.S. government securities is the Bank of Ireland, and you know the Ireland as a country has a has a GDP of like 240 billion, so they've got more reserves than. You know, more than 100% of their GDP they hold in U.S. dollar reserves in the reserve account. Um, and, and, and I mean, Ireland's a country of 6 million people. And, uh, you know, with, a, with you know, like I'm, I'm even saying, look, I'm in Canada. And in Canada, we have, we have 36 million people and we have a, we have a two and a half trillion dollar economy. And like we only have eighty billion dollars worth of U.S. of U.S. reserves, like the Bank of Canada only has eighty eighty billion in in U.S. dollars in the reserve account. Well, like why why and how does the uh, Bank of Ireland have have that that kind of dollar reserve? You see, and and I'm going to answer my own question or what I'm posing is I don't believe it's really the, the Bank of Ireland that owns all those securities. I believe that the Federal Reserve has an account at the Bank of Ireland, and they buy, they buy the uh, securities in the name of or with the cover of uh, the Bank of Ireland, but they have an account there. And uh, this, this, is the way, this is the way they can, can, can do 
QE via stealth without declaring it. And I mean, and then you'd say, well, hey, that wouldn't that be illegal? And then I'd say to you, well, don't forget the Federal Reserve is not federal. No more federal than Federal Express. And and I think I think most of the listeners would be attuned with that and know that the Federal Reserve is no more federal than Federal Express. They're just a company. And there is a law on the books in America, it was passed in 1934, and it allows the uh, uh, designates of the president in the United States in the name of national security to allow companies not to report their true financial condition and, in fact, keep what amounts to two sets of books. So these laws are on the books in America, and, and, and there's absolutely no doubt in my mind at whatsoever that these, you know, these things have not been in play in the last six or eight years, since 2008. Absolutely they've been in play. So and then, and then then it really becomes a question of how much have they been in play and who has been issued the passes and and who is it who hasn't had to report the true financial condition at certain times. And I could think of probably 3 4 or 5 names in the American financial universe that have probably been granted a waiver where they haven't had to report their true financial condition. Because it only makes sense. I guess. Because there's no other there's no other way, Dave. You see, when you put if you've got a ten piece puzzle and you put it on the table, there's only so many way so many ways ten pieces can fit together. And you know when you arrange them into a and and here's the other thing, you you put enough pieces of the puzzle together, Dave, and you know what the picture is, even though you haven't snapped the last few pieces in. And I'll just tell you something we're we're not living in Kansas anymore and our our global financial edifice is in a very precarious position right now and it all and that all blows back to why I've been long been an advocate of owning physical precious metal not paper and 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 I'm and I would be an advocate of owning physical precious metal over any cryptocurrency as well because I do believe in the case of cryptocurrencies, I do believe that there's a thing called an internet kill switch. And if you have your wealth all tied up in a, in a, in a, in something crypto, you know, the, if the internet goes dark, where are you? So anyway, it, it just, it just takes me back to the notion that you've got to, you've got to own for financial insurance purposes and, and to protect yourself, you need physical precious metal. So there you go. Rob, looking forward into 2017, um, do you believe that the central bankers, they will actually bring the economy down under under Trump if he is in office? How do you think this is all going to play out? Um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past the the elites, the globalists and, and, and the globalists. The globalists are basically a banking syndicate and. If if they get their feathers ruffled enough, yeah, I could see them creating creating economic misery for everybody, uh, in hopes in in hopes that people will demand Trump be removed, and this this may be what what they have in store for for Mr. Trump. So it'll it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. I think there are some wild cards still uh, um, in that. They have to be a little bit careful into in terms of how how much they would allow the economy to to tank because when 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 things get get real nasty uh, things like revolution and uh, like nobody's safe nobody benefits from a world in chaos complete chaos and the globalists have always wanted to have the upper hand and have control. And uh, so, so they might be well advised to be careful if, if they have it in mind to, to bring the U.S. economy down to its knees. Uh, just, you know, they might get a little more than they wished for. But I think we're, I think we're in for a very, very, very tumultuous uh, and we're living in interesting times. Uh, that's for sure. But very interesting year, I think, in the offing. 
Rob, I really appreciate you being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Thank you very much. Once again, how can people see your work? You can find me on the web at kirbyanalytics.com. All right. Thank you very much, and Happy New Year once again. My pleasure, Dave. and or bars and or jewelry and by by outlawing 90 percent of the float of fiat currency in the country um i mean what they did is they created chaos but they 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 were they were clearly trying to dampen uh, demand and, and the trade for physical metal by outlawing the old currency and when they outlawed the old currency, they tried to give a backstory that the old currency was readily exchangeable for new currency. And the, but, but the problem was they didn't have enough of the new currency printed and on hand to allow people to do one for one exchanges. And, the, and they, they rationed the new currency. So, so what they in effect did was say to people, you can bring your old currency to the bank and deposit it. But then we will only allow you to extract it something like to the equivalent of sixty dollars a day, and so this way they put they put a they they put a basically they made or created artificial scar scarcity of currency in 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 the country, and uh, uh, what they were what they were trying to do was dampen demand or dampen the amount of takeoff of physical. Uh, gold bullion and uh, interestingly it, it would seem by most accounts that I've read that that was a complete and utter failure and if anything gold consumption is up in in India and and as a corollary to that story while these concerted attacks by officialdom have been occurring on paper metal and physical metal Paper metal, in, in, in the case of the two exchanges I mentioned formerly, and on the physical side in, in India, we have seen a dramatic, and I mean a very dramatic, rise in the price of Bitcoin, which is a cryptocurrency, but which some people, and in, and, and in particular the Chinese, see as a viable alternative to fiat money. So isn't isn't it interesting that you can you can suppress so many things, but suppressing and, and, and I find this very, very interesting and very ironic at the same time, because physical metal is being suppressed. But yet, uh, because physical metal, uh, on, on, let's just say it this way, Dave, on an exchange, uh, the people buying and selling on an exchange in, in, in paper, gold and silver, they don't they can't tell the difference between a physical ounce and a paper ounce because they all get sort of mixed into the same call it a slurry. But you go to the cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and you, you cannot sell a Bitcoin unless you own a Bitcoin. There is no futures market for Bitcoin. There is no optionality in Bitcoin. If you want to buy a Bitcoin, you need to you need to where the sun doesn't shine. And and two, and two or two or three of the other largest players in the world in the same are Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and Citibank, and Bank of America too, for that matter. And you know the notion the notion that other banks of other nationalities would be engaged in something that the American banks wouldn't be is a, is a dog that just doesn't hunt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I, I believe that this goes throughout the American banks and all the way up to the, the central banks. I don't think this is just, you know, the HSBC. It's not just Deutsche Bank. I think it's much more widespread than what they're letting us know and what they found out at this point. Well, the big, the big thing is, you know, the question you have to ask is that I think in Latin they say, qui bono, who benefits? Who right. benefits from a suppressed metals price? Well, 
the, the biggest the biggest beneficiaries of suppressed metals are the owners of the current world reserve currency, which is America and the U.S. dollar. So anything that would be this vital to the American dollar and, and U.S. national interests, you don't think that there would be a, a huge American bank front and center in all of this? The proposition is ridiculous to begin with, that anyone even would entertain having such a discussion. Now, you mentioned uh, India about how they were cashing the, uh, I mean, um, banning the 500 and 1,000 rupee. We also see Greece right now, they're doing what's called a soft cash ban. And we're seeing a lot of these countries do this where they're trying to, I guess, take away the idea of using cash. And it looks like Greece right now, they're telling their taxpayers that you have to spend a certain amount only using plastic, you know, the debit card or whatever. You cannot use cash. And if you don't do what we say, you're penalized. And we're starting to see this spread throughout different countries. Do you think they're taking these countries and using them as test beds to see how the cashless society will work? Oh, absolutely they are, Dave. And I mean, the, 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 what, what they won't admit, but what they are in fact doing, is they are trying, trying to institute uh, um, currency regimes or currency schemes where, where every transaction can be tracked and, and basically where, where transactions in undesirable things can be, can be uh, either eliminated or curtailed. And if you, you see, when you're doing business in cash bills, your transactions are quite anonymous because you can exchange, you know, a wad of bills for, you know, maybe a gold coin or two or three. And, uh, you know, the government has no way of tracking where the gold is and who owns it. But if they can, if they can get everybody onto a digital platform where every transaction is cataloged and, and, uh, uh, you know, can be basically assigned a number, then they know, they know who has what and at what price they pay. And welcome to the X-22 Report Spotlight. Today, we have a returning guest, Rob Kirby. He's from KirbyAnalytics.com. And I am very happy to have him back on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Rob, welcome back to the Spotlight. Pleasure to be with you, Dave. And Happy New Year. Oh, Happy New Year to you, too. And here we are in 2017. And the beginning of the year, we see the Dow approaching 20,000 points. And we see gold is still hovering around 1,100 and change. And my first question to you is, is what is your opinion and what, what do you have on why gold has dropped to 1100 and there are those individuals out there saying that it's going to go down even further what is your take on where gold is where gold is heading in this new year well i would uh, uh, suggest to anybody who wants to listen that the price of or the paper price of gold and silver both were attacked um uh, with with a lot of zeal on the back of the uh, election of Donald J. Trump on November eighth, and if if you were pay, if you were paying attention on election night, you you would note that the initial reaction to Trump being uh, uh, awarded the win uh, was for the Dow Jones futures to initially sewer to the tune of eight hundred points. And gold was up roughly seventy dollars uh, in the minutes after uh, Trump. It became apparent that Trump had won, and lo and behold, the central planners uh, that that are the plunge protection team and the edifice surrounding it in America showed up for work, and the uh, seventy dollar up in gold was turned around and. Uh, you know, made into a $70 down and the 800 uh, within 24 hours, the 800 point down for the Dow was uh, translated into a three or 400 point up. 
the, these were these were clearly, clearly, and utterly uh, the work of central planners, because we know for a fact that the volume of paper gold contracts that were sold in the three days uh, following the election amounted to uh let's just say three times annual global mine production in gold sold in paper form in three short days uh beginning beginning late in the day on the 8th through to the friday uh three years worth of global mine supply was sold in paper form in, in, in the gold market alone you see this this is the hallmark this is the signature of 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 interference and, and of price suppression. And what, what the elitists who control our system currently are paranoid of is create an account, and then you need to pay with fiat money. And to sell a Bitcoin, you must have a Bitcoin. You cannot sell Bitcoin you do not own. And isn't it interesting that when something pops its head up with any kind of a possibility of being an alternative how its price takes off in a real market where 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 there isn't interference where there isn't suppression and anyway i found this as a very very interesting thing because like our our global capital markets are a very complex place with a lot of moving parts at the same time but there are pictures that emerge from what is occurring if you have your wits about you and if you're if you're paying attention. So, and anyway, I don't I don't say this as an endorsement of Bitcoin. I, I don't say it as an endorsement or a rejection of anything. All I'm saying is, isn't it interesting that when you have a forum where where basically free market conditions prevail isn't it interesting what happens in a free market yeah, alternatives not. alternatives can rise in price dramatically but in controlled markets it's not allowed that that is very interesting how when the central bankers they're not really touching it getting involved in it because we know the precious metals market from deutsche bank uh ubs and hsbc we know that you know, they were manipulating, it most likely goes all the way to the top of uh, where the central banks are, manipulating the precious metals market. When they're not touching it, when they're not controlling it, it's amazing how it does take off. But Dave, um, yeah, but Dave, and listen, I, sorry, I have to interject here because there's, there's, there's another point, another big, big point to be made here. Okay. I mean, the precious metal price suppression begins and ends with American banks. Why has not one American bank been named in this in this uh, 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 precious metals rigging case? That's that's a question, uh, you know. And and I'd like someone to answer it. Somebody somebody from officialdom, because you see, precious metals are all about the U.S. dollar. And the the the, the ringleader in, in in precious metals price suppression is is the U.S. Treasury itself, and namely the Exchange Stabilization Fund, which is a secretive arm of the U.S. Treasury that's engaged in everything and anything, and operates above all laws, and they use as their agents uh, uh, the broker for the exchange stabilization fund is the New York federal reserve trading desk and the New York federal reserve trading desk acting as broker for the exchange stabilization fund, uh, disseminates their orders to the commercial banks, the big derivatives houses in New York. And anybody, anybody who does not believe that JP Morgan is the biggest trader in, 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 in precious metal on the planet, uh, uh you know, has their head somewhere where that we we get a manic we get a manic takeoff in the price of metals because the uh, the physical the physical metals market does represent a challenge to this uh, you know the supremacy of the dollar as the world's primary reserve currency. So, Dave, what we what we've seen over the last little while is a very very concerted attack 
on the paper price of precious metals because central planners do not want uh, uh, metals, specifically silver and gold, assume their rightful mantle as uh, as money, which they are, by the way, whether 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 they're suppressed or not, they are they will always be the go to and and the uh, uh, you know the, the 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 true expression of desire uh, for for the world's population as money. And isn't it interesting um, in, in, in light of this severe suppressive action being taken by monetary, the monetary elites, and it's, and it's been more than just the, the straight paper markets that have been affected because they've also been trying to work over very hard the, uh, the organic demand for physical precious metal uh, with actions that, that have been taken in India. And, and let me just frame, frame up the Indian situation a little bit here, because the head of the Reserve Bank of India uh, is, a, is a chap with a last name, Rajan. And Mr. Rajan is the vice chairman of, of an institution called the Bank for Inter International Settlements, which is headquartered in Basel, Switzerland. And the the uh, Bank for International Settlements is often referred to as the central bank for central banks in that global central bank policies are typically coordinated through the Bank for International Settlements and, and, and implemented from that point. So the, the attacks that we've been seeing on metals have been global in nature and not just limited to the to the uh, paper markets in uh, both New York and in London, uh, New York on the COMEX exchange and London on the London Bullion Market, uh, uh, L London Bullion Market Association, LBMA. What, what the experiment that they've been working with or that they tried to implement in, in India was they effectively outlawed 500 and 1000 rupee notes, which uh, the old notes constituted something close to 90% of all currency in circulation in India. And people should realize that the, uh, or, or would do well to realize that the gold market in India is a cash market and it's a physical market where people exchange banknotes for physical coins.